Attention, please. Eastern Airlines Flight 19, now ready for departure. Welcome aboard the Walt Disney World Express Monorail. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're entering the vacation kingdom of the world. There's enough land here to hold all of the ideas and plans we could possibly imagine. We call it Epcot. Will be our experimental prototype city of tomorrow. Welcome to another episode of the Retro Disney World Podcast. Taking you back to the vacation kingdom of the world, the way it was, and the way it is in your memories. Okay, everyone, welcome back to the Retro Disney World Podcast. This is episode 12, and this one is entitled, There's No Place Like World Showcase. We're going to take you back to World Showcase in the early days of Epcot Center, and we have a very special guest, which we'll talk to in just a few moments. But before we get to that, uh, introduce everybody, as always, uh, sitting in with me tonight. Uh, JT Couser, how are you tonight? Good, Todd. How are you? Uh, not too bad. Uh, how? About- Hello, huh? Hello, how? How you and I got to meet? Yes. Yes, yeah. you did. At good old Jock Lindsay's bar. Yeah, shared a good... What was it? The Scottish Professor drink? Scottish was- Professor. That yeah. kicked some butt. That, that was a great cool? drink. The, the place is very cool. It was it was a great oh, place to sit down. You got to go there. We'll, we'll all meet. We'll broadcast from the boat. <laughs> That's right. And Brian P. Miles, as always, from Philadelphia. How are you, Brian? Greetings from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. There we go. So, all right. So this month, as we said, we're going to take you back to World Showcase in the early days of Epcot. Uh, we do have a special guest, and uh, that special guest is Glenn Simpson. We're going to be calling him in a couple moments. And uh, he did a lot of different things things uh, over at Epcot, especially in World Showcase. And uh, we're going to talk to him and, and get some insight to Carnival de Lumiere. And uh, we're also going to talk to him about uh, some of the tr- transportation uh, and also talk about uh, Canada as well. So uh, let's uh, let's give him a ring. Not you, sir. Sorry. Hello. Hey there. Hi, Glenn. Yeah. Welcome to the Retro Disney World podcast. How are you? I am super. How are you? Excellent, excellent. So we've uh, communicated via email. I, I know we uh, uh, crossed paths on one of the Facebook groups for uh, people who had worked at Disney in the past, and uh, I connected with you and 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 you know you explained that you had worked in uh, some some areas of Epcot in the past. And um, but I guess your story goes back a little little further than that, back over to the Magic Kingdom for a little bit before we get over to That's Epcot. Right. Yeah, is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. Um, I, I started uh, at Disney in 1978. Uh, I was 18 years old, and I began in a, a division food service, what was called Outdoor Foods. And, and back then, it included um, popcorn wagons, and they still have them, and then ice cream wagons. And that was a wonderful experience, but I ended up transferring after a couple of years and was actually a Jungle Cruise skipper. Um, and, and I have a lot of corny jokes that I still still share with people and they usually <laughs> groan. Um, but that was a great and absolutely great experience. Met a lot of great people there. And that's one of the Disney attractions that is very interactive between the cast member and the guest. Um, so it's more than just saying, Hey, watch your step or, you know, that sort of thing. It's actually part of the show. Right. So right. an awful lot of fun back then we actually used real guns. I, they don't use guns there anymore from what I understand. And uh, we did not use real bullets, though, but we did use Smith and Wessons, and every night we had to clean them. And that whole section, for from uh, the way the divisions were, it was Main Street Adventureland. So one of the things is I was what was called a lead, which is sort of like a foreman or something, the person that's in charge for that shift of that particular attraction. Mm-hmm. And so uh, part of the management philosophy of Disney is to move folks around. So about every season, three or four times a year, we would move different attractions. So I had the opportunity to work everywhere within Main Street Adventureland from an operation standpoint. And uh, one time, uh, uh, starting up a steam train, I ended up setting myself on fire. Uh, <laughs> briefly, uh, lost some eyebrows and everything, and I was given the... W- the award for the best winter suntan of, <laughs> I think it was 1981. Oh. Um, but anyways, I was very embarrassed about it. Didn't think I uh, had done so much damage. The the head foreman that uh, ran the trains, you know, the guy who really knew how they worked, 
I uh, thought it was pretty funny um, that I set myself on fire briefly. Um, but apparently I was pretty red and I lost my eyebrows and some other things. So people realized uh, rather quickly when I got the train to the station that something had happened. Um, but uh, that was even turned out to be sort of a great experience, even though it could have been tragic, I guess. But all the opportunities that Disney gave me and thousands upon thousands, maybe today millions of people, to do things that you would never do anywhere else. Like how many people can say, they drove us. They were a steam train engineer. Right. You know how many people can say that they drove a monorail or um, a jungle boat or you know got to shoot guns in a, a, a at, at hippos. <laughs> Granted, the hippos weren't real, but got to shoot guns at hippos. My favorite job in the Magic Kingdom was uh, a lead on Main Street, and even though there was. No big attractions. There was a Disney story back then in the theater. They had the chitneys and the omnibus, the horse and carriage, but a lot of shows. So uh, if I was working day shift, I would have the opportunity to walk the big boss down the street, and his name was Mickey. You may have heard of him. <laughs> and um, always, they would always have character handlers with them, uh, folks that would be working directly with the characters. And then they usually have operations people as well for kind of crowd control and that sort of thing. So sort of behind the scenes weren't really the, the, the front runners, the operations folks a lot of times, um, but just the opportunity to uh, do things that um, you, you wouldn't be able to do in any other job. It's really cool right, to be right. part of that. In what's sort of the early days of the Magic Kingdom, to some degree, it, uh, it opened, as you know, in 71. Mm -hmm. And then to have the opportunity to transition before Epcot, which was called Epcot Center back then, opened was uh, an absolutely wonderful experience. So so when, what, about what time frame in the, in the early 1980s, when, when did you start the transfer over? Because you were there uh, in Epcot pre-opening. So when, when did you start the transfer? Yeah. How, how... Um, yeah, so so it, it, they had obviously the construction crew. Epcot took you know uh, a couple of years or more to mm -hmm. construct, uh, as you well know. They started bringing over the operations folks probably six to eight months before, um, and so I went over. Uh, Epcot actually had a soft opening in September of '82. I probably went over there in April, uh, sometime around there, um, and in we wore. Um, the operations cast wore kind of like, uh, what you would say, like maintenance outfits or something like that, you know, sort of, and we wore hard hats and there was still a hub of construction, but operations, we came in to help with test and adjust. Um, in some cases that would be the rides. And in my particular case, it was a circle of vision, uh, uh, theater mm -hmm. working closely with the Imagineers on, um, actually timing of doors and, Disney has always been very automated, very right, computerized, right. and all of that takes to set everything up. It takes a, literally weeks and months to put that all together. Um, when you arrived there in in April '82, you know we know that a lot of things at Epcot were were done last minute to get the completion. What what percentage of the uh, Canadian Pavilion was actually completed then? Uh, it sounds like you were doing timing tests and things with doors. Did that occur later on, or or how did no, that? No, no. The, the the for the majority of the pavilions, the physical plant, the exteriors were completed. Most of the interiors were completed. Mm -hmm. They may be doing carpeting and painting. Landscaping was in process. Uh, Canada especially had the uh, the the garden area, right, uh, to mimic them. the uh, yeah, uh, and so there was work being done on that. But the last the uh, the rock formations, uh, the the facades, that was all all in place. Um, some of the fencing, um, uh, safety fencing, et cetera, around uh, the lagoon, et cetera. Probably some of the lighting wasn't in place, but the idea was they wanted to keep everything safe, so we dressed as if it was a dangerous area. But for the most part, in the area's ex exterior, it it was primarily done. In, in the attractions, uh, more of the ride attractions in Future World, um, that test and adjust is that they were working on tracks and everything. But by the time operations got over there, the rides were kind of running, uh, but not running fully. So yeah. animation was in, say, in Spaceship Earth, et cetera. The track was working, but they were trying to work out, from an engineering standpoint, their kinks. Right, and right. so the operators came in to kind of... Um, you spend a lot of time just watching stuff. Right. And um, it, the, the, in my little world, I can remember sitting for a whole shift or laying 
Pearl Holshik almost on the floor in the <laughs> Circle Vision Theater in Canada, watching the movie over and over as they're getting the. Um, it was uh, the technology was just uh, phenomenal even, right. even back then. I've got but to ask you a question was, about the, sure. the the facade. Every time my wife walks by, she wants to know what's up in the very small forced perspective windows of the recreation of uh, Chateau Laurier or Chateau Frontenac, whichever one it's parallel. It, it, as far as I know, did you ever get up there? Uh, nothing. Nothing. No, as far as I know, <laughs> nothing. Uh, it is a forced uh, uh, perspective. Right. And so that building is relatively small. You're right, right. Just like the castle in the Magic Kingdom is smaller than what, what, what it looks. Um, there, there was a shop um, in the first story. There was storage, as mm-hmm. I recall, above the shop. But way in the top, I think it was just kind of uh, open open just space. To, just but there was storage up. for the shops, I believe, uh, in in the chateau on the second on the second level. You could peer out of a three quarter size window. So how how long was your was your stint there at at, at the Canada Pavilion? Um, I was actually I was the first lead, and then they were um, two two others, and then three others of us. And I was at that particular location for uh, about five to six months Mm -hmm. and then i moved over to same kind of department but then uh moved over to what's called lagoon transportation right and And we've got some great questions for you on this i know how how's got this omnibus thing (laughs) for the and we've got some uh Boat question. And I have an omnibus well. story that I'm, I hesitate to share, but I will since it was so long. Oh, we, oh we we'll go for it. it. We, yeah, we'll go let's for hear it. it. Let's hear it. So, so the omnibuses uh, were, um, they were originally in the Magic Kingdom, and they brought them from the Magic Kingdom, repainted them. Magic Kingdom, they were kind of a hunter green, mm-hmm. you know, they look older. They repainted them when they came over to uh, Epcot. I believe they built a few new ones, and then they did different types of colors. So there was a Paris, which was a light blue, and then uh, a maroon one, and, and that sort of thing. And I was not a regular driver or operator of, of the bus, I, but I knew how to drive them. But I didn't actually carry guests on, typically, unless somebody was out sick or something. But they were stick shifts. And they were really two-story buses and everything. And one early, early morning, um, before rope drop and rope drop in Disney cast member terms is when the park opens up, they let people to the ticket booths and then they bring them into an X point in the magic kingdom. It's before the castle, uh, at the end of main street in Epcot, it is, uh, into future world. And then say if the park opens at nine o'clock, they drop the rope and then the hundreds of thousands of people start, you know, scurrying to run to their favorite attraction to be the first in line. And, um, this was a particular morning and I was at America uh, adventure area checking the area in. I would drive the bus in the morning to check the area and the, at the America garden theater by the shore, there was some um, equipment that was left over name and it didn't, it didn't, uh, it wasn't a good show. It mm-hmm. wasn't something that uh, we would want the guests to see. And I don't really remember what equipment it was, but, I knew that the rope drop was about happening. I could kind of see the crowd on the other side of the lagoon, which was probably half a mile away. Right. And I thought, I've got to figure out a quick way to move move them. So I decided to drive the bus backwards <laughs> down to the American Garden Theater by the shore. And they have all these fiberglass benches. But the way the, um, the, way the theater is set up, the uh, space in the aisle starts narrowing like many theaters. So it's wider at the top and narrow at the bottom. And I just, uh, so I got whatever I needed to get on the bus. And I wanted to think that they were stanchions. I got them on the bus and I went to pull out. It's on an incline. It's a stick shift. And if you've ever driven a stick shift in a vehicle that, you know, <laughs> double, double-decker double vehicle, and not many people probably have, it kind of hesitated to go backwards. So I ended up driving into a bench. <laughs> and I thought, uh-oh, this is going to be a problem. But I checked the bench and the bench was fine. Perfect. You know, because it's fiberglass and they're made. So I went about my business. I got the bus up, unloaded the equipment. And about two weeks later, I got called into my supervisor's office. And I could tell it wasn't a, going to be a pleasant conversation. And um, they asked me if I'd had anything happen on a bus. And um, I'm usually a pretty honest person, but at the time I lied. And I said, no, no, I don't know what you're talking to, talking about. And... Um, what had happened is, even though the bench was okay, 
I'd actually move the chassis of the bus a few inches <gasps> oh. over the wheel. So, so the maintenance crew figured out there's something wrong with the bus. Luckily, nobody ever got hurt with it. And so I finally did confess, and uh, I think it was my only written reprimand in all the years I worked for Disney. And it was the wrong thing to do because I should have fessed up. But I drove one of the omnibuses back over a bench. So the moral um, of that story is that the, the the benches are more secure than the, than the, than the bus. Right. The bus. Yeah. And the real moral should be honesty is a bad policy. But, right. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh. Those, those benches, those because um, they look like they're wood. You know, they just look like park benches, uh, but it's steel and fiberglass. So they're they're industrial strength benches. Right, right, right. I was really hoping you popped the clutch in a hurry and peeled out an omnibus. That's what I was hoping for. <laughs> well, no. I think we do have to thank you because there was this long-standing question of whether or not any of the buses came from the Magic Kingdom over to Epcot. So you certainly answered that. Yeah, like, and at that point in time, so Magic Kingdom no longer uh, it, it was a big transition because you know a lot of people don't like change and so it was hard for the Main Street crew like the people that I, I work with uh, at Main Street and then for guests because all of a sudden the buses left um, the Magic Kingdom but um, the idea of the World Showcase um, the circle the, the sidewalk around there is pretty extensive and to go from one side to the other so the idea was to provide transportation they only used omnibuses they didn't use the, the uh, the uh, kidneys and the fire engine, little fire engines, right, and, right. and what was called O3 from the Magic Kingdom over there. And then they and eventually then they loaded the, the buses ship. up with, with characters and steel drums and all sorts of weird things, right? Right. And then they also had the friendships, which were these boats um, that were really hard to drive for me, anyways. Right. We, we and, have a question on that, too, because we have a very early film. How do you remember? I, I think it's one of the very, the one from opening, like a couple months after opening, one of the films yeah. we reviewed. And if I recall correctly, there were some of the different boats. They weren't the friendships weren't installed yet, right? They were using right, the they ones that they, they didn't. The, they weren't finished yet, so they used the resort, the resort launches the right, first the couple of months. Launches. So do you remember? They used the launches this? for a period of time that was from Bay Lake and Seventies Lagoon. Right, right. Do you know how long that was? Um, my recall is the friendships came in pretty early in the beginning, so I, I would not have, uh, you know, from my recall, wouldn't. Yeah, wouldn't I think it was only a couple of. So months. I agree with that. So, but it seemed like what happened is the friendships did not have the capacity to move the guests, so they added the launches. Um, so there'd be launches and friendships at the same time until they could build more friendships, because I think we started with two, and they think eventually they ended up with six. And they were, at the time, and this is early 80s, they were million-dollar boats. Wow. And and their driving system was such, um, you know, well, it's not like a car anyways, but it was a sophisticated driving system that it's with water jets underneath. It wasn't like a regular kind of boat. Mm -hmm. And so you, it had, to, there was a steering wheel, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't the way you steer a car. So it wasn't and like so a rudder took, system under there. Maybe no, move, no, move there the no rudder. Instead. Well, not, no rudder like there is today, right? Okay. Um, I mean, there probably was a rudder to some degree, but it was water jets underneath the boats that actually, and it was that that uh, turned them. So you could be, you know, you could drive a car, you could have had some experience with boating, but a friendship was a different type of boat to drive. While the launches, the smaller boats almost look like pirate ships to some degree, right. were your more traditional boat uh, as far as the dri driving skills. So uh, I did, wasn't planning to share my sins uh, with you guys, but... <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm extremely nearsighted and was even as a young man, but was sort of uh, self-conscious about wearing glasses. And one day I had to drive a boat and the head supervisor was with me. And I usually didn't drive the boats because I was the person that was sort of in charge of the shift. And I drove the friendship into a dock. <laughs> uh, and um so so it's you just Disney destroyed company. world showcase oh my god <laughs> yeah, you're hitting everything yeah 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 yeah, yeah. It, now, yeah yes, moved, you, I, the, I had problems with it was the dock okay and did you ruin the hull yeah <laughs> no no the dock was okay the boat needed some some repair and so we got off the boat at, at, at the canada dock and i'm walking with my head supervisor and she's not talking to me and i thought pretty sure that There'd be a pink slip by the time we got to the other side, but she had a lot of grace, and uh, it was strictly accidental. I wasn't covering it up. I just kind of 
and I wasn't the first person to kind of knock the dock because of the unusual steering system. But I knew it was probably because I couldn't really see the dock <laughs> <laughs> just because I didn't, I wasn't wearing glasses at the time. So I, I later decided that I would wear glasses if I was driving a million dollar boat. I have, I don't want to derail us from Epcot from too much, but since you're talking about boats and you mentioned that you were a lead on main street, did you ever drive or have any experience with the swan boats when they were there? You don't know. That was a separate, that was still part of the uh, same division, um, but that was a separate crew. And the Swan Boats, even in the early day, like the late 70s, you know, the park hadn't been open that long, ended up becoming pretty seasonal and pretty rare. Yeah. So um, so if they were operating, um, it would maybe be like from 10 to 4. Oh, okay. Or you know, oh, some limited operation. And that was a, um, I mean, I rode on them. And I may have driven one just kind of for the fun of it, but I was never assigned um, down there. But I did did ride on them, but it may have been more as a, as a guest. But they weren't directly, you know, now that I think about it, I think they were attached to Fantasyland. Okay. I think we have operations been, was actually part of Fantasyland. We have been trying to figure out the steering mechanism because it looks like there's two wheels. There's like a left wheel and a right wheel, and yeah. that made no sense to us. Yeah, we we were watching it, and in and, and the friendships were kind of like that too. It was a very different. Um, Could you different drive a drive. swan boat? Did you Not, like understand? No, I don't think so. No, no, I never drove one, and they weren't on a track, so they were really driving though. What did the two wheels do? Yeah, I'm, I'm not. I'm not so sure, but I'm sure you'll find somebody who worked the swan boats. But because it was for a limited operation and for eventually i mean probably in the early 80s i got rid of them right i mean yeah. as far as yeah. uh, um so there's probably less former cast members of that than any other attraction you right, know, right. that was probably the the shortest period that it was an attraction operation. We'll, hunt, we'll hunt somebody down glenn, <laughs> glenn while we're on watercraft do i recall reading or hearing that uh, there were problems with the friendships that first year or two with either the engines or the drive system and they had to put them in dry dock and Redo they, them? They, they they went through a lot of repairs because it was sort of, uh, I, I think the drive system was a Disney Imagineer development, I think. I don't know for sure. So like I said, it was sort of unusual. So anytime you come up with something kind of new, um, there's going to be some hiccups along the way. So that was another reason why they ended up building more friendships. Uh, it took a little while to do that and that they ended up using so many of the launches because the original plan, even when I think I first got to Epcot, the launches weren't going to be part of the mix. It was just going to be the friendships. Right. They were trying to create a whole different experience for guests than what you could get anywhere else in um, the man, in, in any of the Disney pr- property. Um, but they, they were pretty high maintenance in more ways than one, and um, they held a lot of people that were huge. Um, and, and you mentioned there uh, were there were six total built after the first two, and and I, I'm I think so. These are the days before we had the waterway over to the International Gateway and the Beach Club right, Yacht Club Swan Dolphin. So, yeah. did it get to an operation point where you would have four, you know, one at each dock, they'd pass each other, so you know, yeah. and then two in right. in reserve. Uh, yeah, and I and I think it was maybe four, but at least three at a time. Mm-hmm. Uh, I couldn't do more than that. I don't recall you could actually do more than that. You could do a launch or two between them, but they right. were pretty big boats, and the lagoon's not that big. No, so, no, no. Um, I was there just know, a few it weeks ago. Too long to get from one side to the other. Right, I was just there a few weeks ago, and they were just running one on each. I mean, granted, it's October, but so, mm-hmm. but um, well, that's really interesting. So, any other transportation uh, tidbits before we move on to uh, one of the shows that you did there? The Le Carnival de Lune, which isn't really transportation from a guest standpoint, but it, there is a transportation element from an operation standpoint, was the precursor uh, to um, illuminations. Mm-hmm. And Le Carnival de Lune had fireworks, um, and they had fireworks barges, and there was about four probably of those. And then they had these uh, barges that came together to make these huge screens. Um, and they were 40 by 40 foot screens. Um, and what they would do is they would project, uh, it was sort of like a slideshow. So out in the middle of the lagoon, they'd be flashing slides and you could, your best view was from world showcase plaza. You know, you sort of had to be on the, uh, future world side in order to get the best view of the show. And, uh, so illuminations, you know, you can, it's a great view from wherever you are around the lagoon. But back, back then, 
And so you, we'd, um, there would be these buoy, they'd be, you'd have to secure the barges. There were spots that you would tie them to, uh, in the lagoon. And we had several barges. We had the, the, the screen barges, which were much harder to drive because it was like a sailboat, but you weren't trying to have a sailboat. <laughs> and then the fireworks barges, which, um, it would not be completely unusual for the show to be completed and then you'd be driving the barges back and fireworks would start going off. And so there were some scary moments uh, when you're on a barge and there's fireworks over your head. But the the story that sort of comes to mind to me with La Carnival de Lumiere is that it was a very cold January, February night in Central Florida. And Central Florida doesn't get real cold, but this was a cold, cold night. And there was actually snow flurries. And I remember it very well, and what we would do is, uh, those of us in operations, and I think everybody that's associated with the show, because the lagoon, even though it's small, it would get cold out there when it was windy. And so we'd wear these snowsuits, like snowsuits, or ski suits, I guess you call them. And so we were out there one night, and uh, I, we, were having, we were having this huge problem with lining up the screen barges with the, uh, like the buoys that you have to attach them to because of the wind. And um, a lot of times the person uh, that was in charge of the park um, uh, was named Epcot Center 1 on the radio. So I was Epcot Center 25 when I was on duty, and uh, 26 or 27, and then he was one, so he kind of get the, you know, so different. This was before mobile phones or cell phones or that sort of thing. So there were a lot of two-way radios. And so it wouldn't be unusual for him to be sitting at home in Windermere, was what I was told, and him call in and ask, you know, whoever's running the show from operations, how everything was going. So we're, it's almost like, you know, uh, being on the Bering Straits or something, and I'm embellishing this, but what I remember is hard to believe you could be scared on the water in Epcot. <laughs> I think there were white caps or something. And we couldn't get the, the screens were blowing all over the place, and he gets on the phone, and it's like, and actually, I think the uh, call sign for that ship, uh, that uh, was Epcot 27. And so it was sort of like Epcot 27, this is Epcot Center 1, and it's like, you know, so I didn't want to let the big boss know there's any problems, even though we're blowing all over the place, and it's past the start of the show. And he said, how's it going? I said, oh, it's going great, sir. We're doing really well. You know, we're just finishing it up, and we'll be able to start the show in a couple minutes or, or whatever. And uh, later came out that he was actually standing in World Showcase Plaza watching the the barges blow around in the wind because there's like these big 40 foot sailboats out in a storm sort of thing. So um, also as far as uh, uh, I'm really a very good driver, but I, I can remember hitting a couple of barges into bridges and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> From of time course to time. you did. Because they weren't the easiest thing to drive. They weren't the easiest thing to drive. Well, um, it, it, I just did a quick search here too. And it looks like we are just on the cusp of the 33rd anniversary for that. I am, found that the original reception program for the, the start of Le Carnaval de Lumiere was uh, Saturday, October 23rd, 1982. So 33 years wow. ago, just a, wow. just a few days I from now. I was there. There yeah. you go. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, that was a great, I mean, it was a great experience. It was a great show, but you know, over the years, it's just, you know, now it's so phenomenal with the fireworks. And back then they did have the picture lights. So that, you know, or the spotlights and everything that would go into the sky as well. So it was the screens, the picture lights, and then the, the fireworks. But the fireworks were on the barge. They didn't have them behind the buildings yeah. and you know, some of the other locations that they've added them over the years. That's cool. So a few podcasts back, um, Brian had uh, talked about, brought it up, uh, how Ronald Reagan had visited World Showcase. Uh, Brian, you want to mm -hmm. ba backfill that, and then we'll let uh, Glenn talk a little bit about uh, his, the, his experience with that. The Reader's Digest version was that on the second inaugural in uh, January 20th, 1980, it was four degrees in Washington, D.C., so they canceled the uh, inaugural parade to the disconcernation of, or rather the consternation of... Uh, all of the bands from around the country, the high school bands that had come to participate in it. And so uh, Michael Eisner, uh, the fairly newly minted CEO of Disney, called the president and said, why don't you have them bands come down here to uh, Walt Disney World? And so Memorial Day weekend, uh, they closed out, uh, you know, cordoned off World Showcase and the people lined it mm -hmm. and 
Uh, the president made one or two loops around it and all the bands performed and he made a speech there in front of the American adventure. And I imagine that Glenn can kind of take it from here logistically. Right. Because I was there. Um, I was actually, uh, at the Canada pavilion at that, that point in time. And so I wasn't directly involved with the entourage for the president, but, um, and I was a young man at the time and it was extremely impressive, um, to see the setup. Uh, it gives me always kind of had some level of security, um, and that's increased over the years, especially since September 11th. But um, at that point in time, it, it was almost um, uh, it was awesome as well as a little um, uh, surreal. And, and granted, you know, thinking about Disney, Disney's kind of surreal. But they actually had um, what I want to say is snipers, but armed. Um, Secret Service or whatever on each of the t- pavilion roofs, in case anything happened. And the president is behind a uh, bulletproof glass or whatever. Even though he's in the World Showcase, there's all that you know security to get in. Nobody's just coming in. You know, you can't just jump over the fence or something to get in there. But it was I, it was very impressive to me, and like I said, a little a little um, scary to some degree to see the level of security back back then, sure. um, which probably today would even be more so, right? That's just my sense because it, the world seems to be a, probably a little bit dangerous place in some regard. But, but anyways, and, and just to be there with the president of the United States, now granted, I'm on the Canada side and he's in front of American Adventure, so it's not like we had coffee or anything together, but to actually be able to not really see him, but know that he's there and then look around, um, and, you know, the, the media was a little different back then. It wasn't as instantaneous and stuff and probably a little bit more controlled. So I don't know if people watching on TV or would, would have realized sort of what was going on behind behind the scenes with all these armed, uh, uh, like maybe seals or something right, up, right. On, up on all, all, all the roofs. Uh, I mean, we had them in Canada. It seemed like they were everywhere around the lagoon, uh, just, it just uh, being there to protect them. And, um, you know, it was just, and, and, uh, you've obviously seen the, um, you know, the, uh, American adventure and then there's a hall of presidents to actually have a living president, uh, standing in front of the American adventure was, uh, a, a very kind of awe inspiring, uh, day, day for anybody that was there. I'm sure I know it was for me. Oh yeah. Now, absolutely. Were, were you given any specific instructions on like what to do when Reagan's there? Like, don't touch him. Don't talk to him. <laughs> Well, yeah, we were we were it. very distant from it, but there was some. Um, the operation was a little bit different that that day, just in terms of crowd control and, and that kind of thing. And I think that they did control the flow um, into World Showcase. So, um, you if know, I the, recall from the video, too, very high it was security, quite quite heavy. There was a lot of people in the park that day too. I remember being. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know where it, because it's kind of like a neck coming in from uh, Future World, so there could be some control points. Uh, you know, in terms of again, for me, it seemed like they uh, Disney would have so much control over the environment, and to have the added you know people on the roofs with the rifles and everything, just to kind of make sure. It's like okay, uh, that, that was that was that was an interesting experience. I don't think you'd normally see people with guns on top of Disney roofs. So. No, not normally. Uh- I'm Danny Kaye. And I'm speaking to you live and wet from Epcot Center. This is the realization of Walt Disney's dream to create a permanent showcase of technology and world culture. After Epcot opened, they had a live show, and it was Disney would often do these partly taped, partly live productions. And so it was the grand opening of Epcot, and Danny Kaye was the frontliner, and there's other celebrities involved. And so they spent a few weeks doing some shots, filming around. But the night of the actual show that went on uh, the network, um, it poured rain. And I've never <laughs> actually seen the show, because this was sort of before VCR, before I had a VCR anyway. Uh, I see pieces of it on YouTube, but at some point in time, I like to see the whole show. Because there's these live shots of uh, hundreds of people at American Adventure Garden Theater uh, standing outside with umbrellas over their head because it's pouring rain. And my job for a few minutes 
was to hold the umbrella over Ron Miller, who was the uh, president and CEO of Disney at the time. <laughs> and, and Mr. Miller was extremely tall, and I'm relatively short. And so I remember it was kind of a task to get the, um, the umbrella over his head um, <laughs> and everything, because I was told, no, he can't get Mr. Miller. Well, he seemed like a very nice guy and everything, but, you know, he wasn't supposed to be getting wet. Oh, boy. I must tell you, I've had a wonderful time here at Epcot. And I hope, I hope some of you share that feeling as well. On behalf of Epcot and all the people who took part in this show tonight, on behalf of all of them, I would like to thank them. I would like to thank you. And I'd like to send you the very best of wishes. Good luck and good night. And I hope to see you soon. So, uh, so there's this little shack in Canada and I, I want to say that uh, it either used to be, or still currently is kind of the show control room for, uh, for the shows back then was, is that, am I totally off or is that actually accurate? Um, I don't remember a shack. I remember a rock. Oh, okay. In Canada with a side door, like a, you know, a lap, a facade rock. Okay. Um, that's my recall. It didn't look like a building. And um, it didn't run the show, but it was related somewhat to uh, there was some equipment um, in, in there, like buttons and, and stuff to run something. But okay. operations, we weren't directly involved with that. That would have gotcha, been gotcha, gotcha. people. But yeah, because they'd have this uh, across on the lagoon side, there was a ser- series of, quote, rocks, like boulders. Right. And did you do and, and Disney did a lot of that. You know, there was a lot of hidden, hidden stuff like way before cell phones, uh, uh, and uh, really before we probably used a lot of two-way radios in operation in the Magic Kingdom. There were telephones all over the place, but they were hidden. You know, so there'd be like in a tree or <laughs> <laughs> they were very creative. So if you needed to use a phone, you know, if you were a cast member, you could get to a phone really, really quick. Because, you know, people pass out and you got to call nine, quote, 911 and all that sort of stuff. And only if, usually not to make people carry two-way radios. Um, and back then, the pagers, the beepers, obviously they want two-way pagers, but they were voice activated uh, or voice pagers. They weren't, they weren't digital. So if you got a page, you know, you were hearing a voice from somebody, but you couldn't respond to. There was no two-way communication available. So um, there, there was phones uh you know, kind of your old fashioned black phones or whatever, wired phones all all over the Magic Kingdom. Cool. Being in operations, did you do anything to run the three sixty show there? Or were you more really like crowd control and it seems like it's really oh, interesting. For it's, Canada? Yeah, it's so there's so many places yeah, op- op- that you work. Right. So operation so the the hosts and hostesses that's the operations. Um so the technical part is run by um you know, the technicians in, in the Magic Kingdom is called DAX, um, Digital Animation Control Center or system. Um, and you probably talked to folks that worked in the um, um, blocking on the term, but the control room uh, underneath the castle. Uh, well, uh, Epcot was a little, probably a little bit more decentralized, but still there were these control rooms, obviously, that would run the, run the attraction. So the operations folks, would be, um, you know, controlling doors and that sort of thing. But most things operated automatically. So you could do some overrides, but, you know, so every 20 minutes the doors would open, the five minutes for people to go in, but if somebody was going slow, you could kind of stop the process. Gotcha. But, but you did work the, slow. you did actually work the, work the show then. Work the show, uh, wrote, uh, Disney calls their policies and procedures, standard operating procedures. So I had the opportunity being there a few months before um, they opened is uh, actually writing the procedural manuals for that attraction and then helping with some of the other attractions as well. So then, so we talked to a gentleman once that uh, that was one of the riverboat captains and he put something mm-hmm. in the, in the operations manual because they, there was a hole that he, that uh, they discovered. Uh, so my question is, is there anything that's in the ops manual today that you kind of uh, had to invent on the spot that they're still doing? Uh, you know, probably so, because I would guess, um, especially a tracking like that, probably a whole lot of things haven't changed, you know, that much over the years in terms of the 
uh, operation side of the uh, procedures. So it's, there, there probably are probably are similar. Um, in fact, you know, this is kind of a crazy thing. We weren't really talking about it, but um, before Epcot opened, um, they they were you know they took a lot of pictures uh, for advertising, and there was one picture that they took, um, and they asked if you know they were looking for sort of volunteers to stay in front of American Adventure before the park opened. And uh, last time, last year, when I was down in Florida, I live in North Carolina now, uh, I was in one of the gift shops and their souvenir book, the picture of me when I was much younger, from a distance, I mean, I know it's me, it's still in the book. And it's always been fascinating to me that of the millions of Disney pictures, a lot of times those books have the same same pictures in them. From year to year to year, right. That's fantastic. Um, and and so it's probably same similar for the operation manuals. Is unless there's some change, uh, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? Right. So do you remember any of your spiel? I spiel for Al Canada or for something else? Yeah, for Al Canada. Yeah. Being um, being a Canadian, that seems to be the natural. Being a Canadian, there. eh? Uh, yeah. You know, <laughs> uh, I I could come up with the jungle a little bit quicker than Al Canada. You kind of put me on the spot. <laughs> I know it would say, you know. Please uh, do not sit on the hand stand or sit on the handrail. But <laughs> as far as the opening spiel to intro the movie, if you gave me a few minutes, I may be able to think of it. But um, um, it, it was not as ingrained as uh, you know the jungle the jungle spiel, which is a much longer spiel. There's probably a, a a group separate from this one that would like to hear what a 1978 Jungle Cruise spiel sounded like. Anyway, so at the end of this, we should probably record that for posterity, even though <laughs> exactly. we don't use it on the <laughs> <Yeah>. show. <laughs> Yeah, and it's probably similar today. You know, last time I rode the Jungle Cruise, um, uh, it's still a bunch of corny jokes. Glenn, don't take it for granted, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Glenn, in your in your time in the Canadian Pavilion, did you ever have any visits from Canadian dignitaries? Uh, from time to time, um, they would uh, co- come in, um, um, you know, kind of through the back door if, if they were with a VIP tour and, and that sort of thing. Um, and you know, there's sense that anybody or anybody from Canada, even, um, it, it was a great film. That was the original film in there. Um, 360 circle of vision was still really cool looking. Um, it's probably that technology somewhat dated now because there's the IMAX 3d movies and 3d movies and that sort of thing, but that technology and just the way they film those movies. So yeah, there would be a lot of, I'm not saying the prime minister came in, but there from time to time, there would be your uh, provincial leaders and other dignitaries from Canada. And that would be the same for any of the world showcase pavilions. There was always an international flavor. And I remember one time, um, uh, chauffeuring a, sh- uh, a, a, a not Arabian pavilion, but there was a sh- sh- sheik from Arabia um, that would come. So oftentimes, um, you know, there'd be political dignitaries from around the world in Epcot. Yeah. Uh, speaking of dignitaries, I'm I'm going to jump and ask uh, for the Michael Jackson story. I, I have to hear this. Uh, yeah. So, Speaking um, of dig- uh, dig- <laughs> so, so <laughs> Michael Jackson dig- was He's at, royalty. at this time. Michael Jackson was very popular. It was probably before the Captain EO film came out. Yeah, because when, uh, when, when did Captain EO come out? Nineteen eighty-six. It was eighty-six. Okay. Okay. Yeah, 86. So, so it definitely was thriller. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So um, it was probably more circa eighty-three, maybe eighty-four. He came in supposedly. Um, um, you know, not for any media or something. He was just visiting, but he had this huge entourage, um, and he was. Um, to recall, he wasn't really dressed in a costume, but he was dressed differently than other guests. So it wasn't really this like, incognito. It, though, what, you know, what, what was he wearing? Well, I'm not so sure what he was wearing, but here's how I interacted with with, with uh, Michael Jackson: is he's surrounded by security, but I was with operations, and so somehow I ended up being right behind him and then there's all these screaming girl i mean you know it's just uh he was a uh, uh he probably may have still been a teen at the time i'm not quite sure but you know he was extremely popular and even though he came to be uh his, his dress was somewhat flamboyant it seemed like and so you know you would know it was him plus he had security and his his bodyguards or whatever but one of the fans i guess i'm i'm right literally behind him 
and there's security or whatever around, and there's sort of this mob. So I, if you know the term flat tire, I gave Michael Jackson a flat tire. And what that oh. means, if you don't know what the term is, you step on the back of a heel. Oh, well, man. well, Mr. Mr. Jackson, now I am short, but Mr. Jackson was a little bit shorter than me. And he turned around, and he wasn't a happy camper. And really? I just apologized profusely. But, um, uh, you know, uh, so my claim to fame, you know, and uh, it may be my only claim to fame, but I actually stepped on Michael Jackson's foot. So. <laughs> no, what no, you, no. what you could have said to him is, Michael, it could have been worse. I could have hit you with a bus or a boat. <laughs> <laughs> so I could have run over you. I <laughs> ran Michael Jackson over so, with an omnibus. <laughs> so a complete... A complete different story, but somewhat related, I'll just share for it, is years before that, my parents were in an elevator in Houston, Texas, and the Jackson 5 were in the elevator, and my parents didn't know who they were. And Michael was like seven or eight years old at the time. And so they realized afterwards that they were in with these celebrities. So my mom and dad met Michael Jackson, and I stepped on his foot, you know, 10 10 years later. Nice. That's (laughs) terrific. Now, the question I have, like when a Michael Jackson or something like that comes, are you guys notified beforehand as a cast member? Do you get like a memo? Do you get told like, don't no, look uh, in the it, eye? It, like, it, it would be depending on the level of the celebrity probably and the position of the cast member. So, so how did you know Michael Jackson was going to be there that day? Or just like you came in and somebody's like, hey, look who that is. Right. Well, no, no. In in that particular scenario, um, I, you know, my role was not such that I'd be privy to that information, but I was a showcase uh, lead that day. So as a showcase lead from operations is you're sort of privy to um, anything that's kind of going on and because part of your role is to make sure everything sort of runs somewhat smoothly. And I'm not trying to say it's one person's job. It's everybody's job to do that. But you're just making sure the transportation is working and that, you know, the, 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 and you're really um, walking the whole day. I mean, in that particular job, all you're doing is, is walking. And so we got notified that he was in the park and he'd be coming to World Trade, he'd be with security. And I, which is part of my role, is if somebody came in, I'd probably, you know, be somewhere involved with that if I was on duty in that role that day. So um, in general and, of and like... so just in, in terms of, so just ended up being part of the entourage, but it wasn't something that I had foreknowledge of like a week before or something. And a lot of times these celebrities would come in and they they may not have a direct plan. You know, they'd say, okay, I want to go here. And so the Disney VIP folks, the guest relations folks, would ensure that they got to whatever point that they wanted to get to. So when you'd get, where did you give him the flat tire? So the next time I'm in the park, I can look and be like, Michael Jackson got a flat tire right here. Oh, it was right in front of, uh, uh, it was would have been be- between American Adventure and where Morocco is now, but Morocco wasn't there back then. So it was just uh, west of American Adventure. Where yeah, was he wh- Where was he heading and what did he do then? <laughs> he was he was probably going to American Adventure. That was probably, um, and he was there, like he was there as a guest. Again, he wasn't there that particular visit. Uh, so he wasn't filming anything. He wasn't having interviews with the uh, media. Um, but many celebrities would come in as guests and they kind of really blend in as guests. You know, they would dress a little bit there, you know, they sort of dress incognito or something or whatever. And so they may have a, a tour guide or, you know, a security or something with them, but most people wouldn't realize who they were. Jim, the kind of he just kind of stood out. Um, he used to come to Central uh, Florida a lot during that time period. Really? I remember he used to go to Boardwalk, Boardwalk and Baseball, and uh, Circus World before that a bit. So he used to, for some reason, he used to like to come to Orlando and do stuff. Uh, maybe he was he was right. specking out for Neverland, right? Yeah, <laughs> getting ideas. Right. Yeah. Do you so, remember and, the and shoe his, he was uh, wearing? <laughs> and his yeah yeah I'm not quite sure I wasn't a loafer <laughs> he used to wear yeah, loafers but yeah, yeah, he, did. he had those black I mean. ones right did he have white did he have white socks on <laughs> did you mar the yeah, socks was with he moonwalking your soul. at the time <laughs> yeah yeah no, I think I think so it wasn't your uh, Nikes or anything that's for sure. Well, Glenn, it's been great having you on. I, I really appreciate you joining with us tonight. These stories and, and, and insight into the early operation days uh, in World Showcase have been nothing short of fantastic. Um, so really appreciate you coming on tonight. And hopefully we'll, we'll maybe we'll have you on back and uh, do some 
Jungle Cruise and some other uh, Magic yeah. Kingdom transportation stories. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. Did you, did you did you back anything into? Uh, did you take any of the transportation on Main Street? Did you bump into anything out well, that way? Well, you see the now now. <laughs> um, well, yeah, a couple interesting what? things with some of those. But a good thing about the Jungle Cruise boats, it's on a track, so you can't really do too much damage. To right. It, so to s- that, stay tuned, so. listeners, for for Glenn's Follies Part <laughs> Two. Uh, I'm thinking there's a T-shirt in the works for. There, this, there could like, be a T-shirt for Glenn. Yes. <laughs> I wrecked the following. <laughs> Well, Glenn, once again, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, oh, you're more than welcome. It's we'll been delightful, really. Excellent. Thank you much. Thank you. All right. Well, big thanks to Glenn Simpson for joining us uh, this month, and uh, we'll definitely have him on again. But uh, it is time for listener mail. JT, you've been running out to the mailbag. We got a lot of things in it this month. What do you, What do you got for us? Uh, I got two today. First one is an email from uh, our friendly listener, Todd Brakey. Uh, he had a lot of good links, which actually Todd used, not Todd, um, how used for his uh, Stolport info and in different airlines. But uh, Todd kind of filled in some blanks and, you know, covered some bases on the Stolport with a lot of uh, different links on that. So okay, we'll add those up to our. Uh... Our- yeah, a lot of good info, and I mean, if you're an aviation nut, it was kind of cool just to flip through. So, yep. um, other one was we got a tweet from a guy named Jonathan Mayfield. Thanks, Jonathan. He said, um, "Was there always boat access to Epcot from Disney Hollywood Studios, or did that come later?" I don't know. Who knows that answer? I'm I'm gonna say it came later because when I remember uh, when MGM was open on those first days. Uh, it kind of ended right there. And I want to say it was maybe four or five years later when they reconfigured the parking lot that they added that channel over. Um, Cause all of a sudden it just showed up one day when I went. So I, I'm going to say no, not originally. Cause when was that, when was that channel? Was that Doug when they were putting in the, uh, the, the uh, boardwalk? Uh, could be. It just, you know, it's weird. I even, when I think about it now, until I went back and looked at a map, I didn't realize how that was interconnected. <laughs> just, <laughs> yeah. It's like, I think one day I went out to like catch a bus or something and suddenly there were boats there. Yeah. You, I, can, you, you can tell that Hal is a guy that has always lived within driving distance and, a, and doesn't yes. spend a lot of time in the resorts. That's right. I, I, I have a, I just looked at the Google satellite and, and this is from February 4th, 1995 with Boardwalk under construction. And indeed, in 1995, I see a boat heading towards uh, the studios and the dock is there. So it was there by 95 and that channel was open at that point. So I will, uh, I will have to get out my yeah. guidebook. Uh, actually, I can get I have access to my opening day guidebook through the magic of instantaneous time. I will stop talking when I start talking it will be in my hand again. No, it's it's not there on opening day. It's just. There's the opening day line. of MGM. of Disney MGM. Yeah. yeah, so somewhere between May '89 to well, this last picture that we have is February 1995. So, well, when did uh, when did the when did those resorts the open? Wrestling. Well, uh, I'm looking at the picture here. I mean, it's definitely clear that that Swan and Dolphin and uh, well, Beach yeah, they were open in 1990. Yeah. So the boardwalk okay. opened later on. So, so they were there. Yeah. Right. yeah, yeah. So, so let me go. Go ahead here. So here's a uh, here's ninety four. Here's Kermit and the Muppets. It's weird. Bus parking, medical parking, kennel. They're still not showing it. And this is the Real. year after the twentieth. So that would have been what ninety ninety one. With like all these guide maps. All Let right. me check my um, Florida Department of Transportation satellite. There's I have so- February nineteen ninety, and the dock is there. Oh, okay. This Maybe is they just Florida Department of Transportation Liar! photo. And Apparently, they just didn't put it in the maps. They they may, may not have now. Maybe the dock was there and they weren't offering service yet. Hmm. Um, but it looks like so. There's there's partially answer. So it's about uh, at least in February 1990, the dock did in, indeed exist. All right. Well, thank you, Jonathan, for writing in. We got your answer there sometime after. Opening up until about uh, at least we can confirm is February 1990s when the uh, the dock first appeared. So thanks for for writing in, uh, JT. Tell them where they can write in and uh, contact us. Yeah, if you have a question, anything uh, like that, podcast at retrodisneyworld dot com. Uh, tweet at us, Facebook us, uh, anything like that. We will get it, and there's a potential it could end up on the show. Yep. Yeah. 
and I just, I just, fi- it finally shows up in the guide maps in 1996. So I don't know what happened between wow. 1990 and 19, but it literally takes until 1990, September 15th through the 21st, 1996. It, it ends up uh, with a sign saying to the Walt Disney World guest boat transportation. So look at that. Took them a while. Putting in the legwork for you. <laughs> that's right. That's what this is. We work hard for you, the listeners. That's right. Making sure we find that answer for you. All right. Well, thanks again to everybody who wrote in. And uh, uh, we're going to talk about some of our uh, T-shirts and merchandise. We have a new design coming up um, for everybody who's who's purchased T-shirts and, and different things that we've sold before. Uh, thank you very much. As you know, we've all upgraded our audio equipment. We've got we're all set with another year of our hosting for the podcast. But how you're working on a new design for a T-shirt? Um, let's let the listeners know, and then we're also going to talk about a new uh, product that we're potentially going to bring out. So, so last time we talked about, but could, we could not get it together because I was going to try to be as accurate as possible. So, uh, so this month we are just, uh, debuting uh, two shirts based on the Stolport uh, that we ran uh, that we ran the stories on last week. Um, we have one that's just a pure Stolport design, and another that celebrates the Shawnee Airways. Uh, that was the major airline. <laughs> That uh, that ran out of the cell port. So major so for two for, months. That's right. <laughs> so we'll we'll be announcing that that when they're available. Uh, follow us on Twitter and also follow us on the on the website and Facebook, and we'll we'll let you know. But we also do have another product coming up that we're going to see what you guys think about it. We are planning on producing a model Shawnee aircraft, the exact twin otter, uh, replicated uh, in one thirty second scale. Uh, I'll come with a, a, a base and, and landing gears, and uh, we'll probably do our own little uh, retro Disney World logo on the base uh, along with uh, the Shawnee logo. So um, we're going to be sending out some feelers for that just to see what uh, everybody thinks and uh, work on getting that uh, product going. So we've got some inside track on how to produce those. So uh, look for that in the next uh, And, and if, if they do get produced... Uh, the people who buy them, uh, the one who makes the best vroom, vroom, vroom video uh, <laughs> yes. with one will uh, will win a prize. Even better, if you get one and you take it down to the end of the runway, you can land it onto the concrete. Let, I want to <laughs> see that. You can pull over to the side of the road just, as you're on yeah. uh, whatever road that is. I I'm... Just run over there. So if you're interested in any of the uh, uh, T-shirt merchandise we already have for sale, head over to RetroDisneyWorld.com forward slash support us. And uh, again, thanks a lot to everybody who, who supported us in the past. All right. With that said, it is time for this month's Audio Rewind. Uh, guys, did you get uh, get last month's? How you supplied it? I, yeah. uh, I actually never experienced that, but okay. I recall. I mean, it's, I'm sure it was there in '88 when I was there, but in subsequent visits, it was gone. So I do not remember. Uh, but but judging by the many the plethora oh, yeah. of responses, correct responses we got, uh, a lot of people do remember it. Right. So so before we we give away the uh, the answer and uh, and the winner, let's take a listen to last month's audio rewind puzzler. All right. Well, there it is. That is officially the Barker bird outside of the Pirates of Caribbean. He was there from the early goings of Pirates of Caribbean. How do you recall when he was taken out? I know it was there when I was there in 81 or so. Yeah, I believe he got taken out when they uh, added Jack Sparrow on onto the experience, and then he got moved over to downtown Disney to the World of Disney store. Mm -hmm. And since then, I... I don't know where he is. If He's anybody lost. knows, wow. let us know. It's like I can't. I don't know if he showed up. We're gonna put him somewhere on else, cart. or if he just kind of flew the coop. So. Yeah. Well, this month's winner is Michelle Amara. Congratulations, Michelle. She sent in the correct answer, and she'll be win- winning the uh, Cinderella Castle uh, miniature Cinderella Castle model that we've got. So um, it's time we have set up for this month, and. Um, did you say you do have a prize? I do. Or? I do have a prize for this. Okay. Part. Well, if you have one, I might as well. I might as well. So, just... I have a King Stephen's Banquet Hall glass mug from one of my trips down there that I'm willing to part with. So, for, for those hot of you and cold beverages, cold beverages, frosty beverages, absolutely. So, okay. for those of you who don't 
recall what King Stephen's Banquet Hall was. It was the restaurant uh, in Cinderella's Castle, which is now, what was it? Cinderella's Back- Royal Table. There we go. I was going to say fantasy When it was fairies. King Stephen's, it was notorious for its horrendous cuisine. Yeah, and I, I, I think it when was... When did it switch? Uh, 10 years ago, maybe? Yeah, somewhere. Does that sound about like right? 2000. Sounds yeah. right. I ate someone, there, I believe this was from 98 is when I ate there. And I, I can't recall if it was good or not. I don't, I don't remember. At some point, someone finally admitted that King Stefan was the wrong king. Right. And they needed to finally <laughs> fix it. And you can, I don't care. You can tell me all these stories about, well, there's this great tradition in castles where they would name one room after a king at a neighboring. Ah, it sounds like a load of hooey to me. Just, just, to make, just a complete right. lack of oversight by someone there. So <laughs> That's right. So, so it's all right. an heirloom. To win the king. Stefan's Banquet Hall uh, glass. Uh, you got to listen to this month's audio rewind puzzler and tell us what it is. All right, so if you think you know the answer to this month's Audio Rewind Puzzler, send your entries to podcast at retrodisneyworld.com. A random winner will be drawn from all correct entries to receive this month's prize. We'll pull one out of random on next month's podcast. Uh, please submit your entries before, let's see, before November 10th, 2015. Um, and remember, all entries will be entered into the big prize drawing in December, which is just two months around the corner here for a replica Paul Hartley WDW map that hung on the walls of the Polynesian Contemporary so many years ago. So it's a really cool prize. You've got to get your entries in There's a uh, for that, and, uh, and we'll go from there. So congratulations again to Michelle, and uh, we'll see who we pull next month. All right, we're going to bring back film restoration this month. We took a break from it last month as, uh, as we went a little over, but... Um, uh, as you as you may know, we purchase in in uh, through other means uh, be able to procure videos and films of uh, old Walt Disney footage. And uh, one of our listeners had had purchased this. Uh, it was a Umatic video, which is a three quarter inch tape uh, used for video distribution of uh, B roll footage from from Epcot Center. And this footage was shot by the uh, Walt Disney Company and was sent around for usage on telecasts or or news clips. Um, and what's great is that there's a lot of different um, shots and segments in here that um, you you may not normally see or may have never even seen before. And what's really great about it is they used all the ambient um, noise and sound. There, there's no overlay. They just used what was going on at the time. So you hear crowds and you hear people talking and, and attractions going on and such. So um, this month we're going to take a look at the Canada portion of the film. It was broken up into 11 different parts, uh, 10 different countries for world showcase and then the uh, first part was a, a general introduction to epcot so we're going to take a look at the the canada now being that this is video we did the best we could to restore it and um so we'll go from there so it starts off with a shot across world showcase it looks like um with one of the friendship boats and the uh omnibus going across now I can't tell if Glenn is piloting either of those. <laughs> well, it, it didn't hit anything, so I don't think it didn't hit anything. <laughs> it was a smooth sail, so yeah. no, Glenn was not driving. That I, I we love you, earlier. Glenn, by the way. We're just kidding. Yeah, it was a great story. Um, does anybody know if it was modeled at the Chateau Laurier or Ch- Chateau Frontenac? Yes, that is absolutely correct. Which one? Because one's in Ottawa, one's in... It's the, the Chateau Laurier. Oh, yeah, okay. All right. Oh. The one in oh. Ottawa. Isn't it amazing while. though? We go into this video era. It just I feel like I'm now in the eighties. Like, yeah. We went from film like that seems so seventies. Now it just has that look of eighties. Oh, and the thing people always think that video is better, but look how crappy it looks. Completely. Oh, it's just yeah, it's it's like <laughs> it's I feel a, like I'm watching like desert storm footage or something, <laughs> like that same quality of just look at the what, slope. You know what it was interesting though, is from a sight light perspective, the, if the camera was over just a little bit more, it's like that uh building would have completely blocked out journey into imagination. It's like oh, yeah. when you were but like if you were over just a little bit more, it kind of peeked through. So that was as interesting to me if that worked. Yeah, we're talking at the fifty second mark. I mean it yeah, you're right. It it really would have blocked out all of the land if you had just moved to the side. So well well done, Epcot planner gentlemen. <laughs> exactly. Around the one minute mark or so, too, there's this really slow pan out from, it's like, almost puts you to sleep. <laughs> but again, this footage would have been used, some some of this footage, um, 
you guys recognize from uh, some of the, the souvenir videos. Souvenir, souvenir videos, videos. Yeah. would have been used on your PM magazines and like all your uh, anytime, you know, they'd say like, oh, something's going in Epcot, you know, right. yeah, used everywhere. Very broad distribution. So, yep. yeah, there's some uh, really neat views of the, of the trees. You got to think of how the trees are so so large now it's really neat to compare it's just weird yeah because i've been here so many times but i feel like i've never been here when i watch this video well and and the interesting thing about b-roll today is it's all so um you know pre-planned and prepared Mm -hmm. and these shots are just of you know they just set a camera up in the park and you see regular guests who aren't paid actors just wandering through places oh look and there's there's oh canada with the original telecom canada like sponsor yeah 151 mark there yeah and they go, no, oh, uh, we're f- no numbers yeah. rolling. Yep, we got some time. shots from from inside the film. So, yep, that's a nice enjoy. Yeah, it's really neat. Oh wow, yeah, there it is. Nice train going across. We're at the two minute mark now. Yep. Everyone, sing along. <laughs> <laughs> that scene I remember with the airplanes was was always cool when they came from underneath you and went across. And so, so you see this scene of them going down the river. Yeah, uh, which they basically recreate when you're in Soren. Right, that's right. Uh, yeah, that's pretty true. much the same thing. Yeah, even flying over the peaks and and yep. And There's instead, a lot, you'll see a lot of Soren uh, of of you well, know the airplane Soren. here, right? It's a jet in Soren, and here it's 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 a uh, yep. Canadian Royal Royal Jets or whatever they so call it's, them. So it would be interesting if you t- if you watch the full original O Canada film and pick out all the shots that that are similar to Soren. Right. They know they worked, so they just reproduce it. Back nice to the waterfall. That's real a waterfall. slow pan. That's maybe this is maybe not the most effective fake rocks they've ever done. I've, no. These never looked real to me. They always just kind of look kind of looks rocks. like a mini golf course in a way, huh? Yeah, yeah. They had. I guess they hadn't perfected that rock technology quite yet. Uh, I'm gonna. We'll stop for a second here because how the guy that did the rocks here is the guy that did like all the rock work in Disneyland. Like whoever their famous rock guy was, yeah, this is one of his last projects was building hmm. these Canadian. <laughs> well, he he didn't he go out just, on a bang according to how. So we're gonna have to edit that out. It wasn't that they hadn't perfected. Maybe he was losing his touch. I forget. <laughs> oh, the guy's name. I just yeah, read yeah. this though. I know who you're talking about. His name was Norman something or other. Or so I just read this in the last Norman the days. Rock Guy. Yeah. All right. So Norman let's Rockwell. Cue it back <laughs> up. <laughs> just good job. Ah, at the three forty four. This flowers. Right. I'm at 3.02 here, still watching The Rocks. So let's uh, <laughs> cue it back up. up. All right. Nothing more interesting than watching Rocks. Yeah. And they take another, around 3.20 or so, they take another slow pan up towards the uh, chateau again. It's very you, peaceful there right now. Using a, it, you're definitely using a boom there to. Uh, yeah, and you're getting a view there of the Victoria Gardens as you come out of uh, the O Canada film. Right. Down by and Pacific. walk by uh, the entrance to. What is now La Cellier Steakhouse, but uh, they do take us inside there momentarily. Uh, but right now you're looking at uh, about 350 mark, some of the flowers and vegetation from this Victoria Gardens replica. Now the steakhouse is... wasn't there when this was filmed? No. If you watch in a little bit, we'll take yep. you inside and tell you what it was. At, uh, f- at the four minute mark, there's a great I'm shot so looking towards the, 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 the bridge there and the, the weeping willows coming down. Really changes the location of the and so now they're about to take you in la cellier they show yep. you the entrance which is mostly unchanged although there's no menu posted outside like there is there's today. the food now they take you Look inside and you see a 1980s buffet look at the macaroni and cheese <laughs> and that what is that like a potato dumpling yeah, it's, like, that's a stuffed cabbage stuffed cabbage yeah i i ate there and it was i i like he just there's drifted down his whole hand yeah <laughs> <laughs> just just slide slide it on. they're showing yeah. you eating in there they're showing the cast members now serving yeah from buffet line uh but it was a buffeteria until the 90s at some point yeah it doesn't the food does not look particular canadian yeah well <laughs> it looks like one of those restaurants that have the barrel seats and the barrel tables and the... so you get a great shot of canadian mountie mickey yeah. uh when they added the characters to epcot they had each country had uh one or two of the characters in you know country appropriate clothing so they had canadian mountie mickey What's he petting that? What's one of our one of our Twitter followers uh, said that that's now on their bucket list was to go and find some of these different characters, but they're long, yeah. long gone. Uh, the shop with Canadian handcrafts. That's right. 
A lot of wood carved four seventeen, yeah. Some pelts. They have there's a nice rat there's a nice some nice pelts there. Oh yeah. They're wood very carver. soft to the touch. I remember I'd go in there and feel up the feel up the <laughs> so pelts. This is this is how it spend first part of the day was eating pies. Yes. Then he pies, would play the Atari eight hundred up up in the centorium and then he'd go feel the pelts. I think that's a new shirt design. Pies and pelts on pies and, WDW. Pies, pelts, and Atari. Hey, look at the bag at the five seventeen with that happy Happy Canadian selling some some wares. That's it right there. Look, that's that's yeah. And then the pan up to looks like uh, Inuit or or some sort of. Uh... Oh, now a shot from the boat. Yeah, yeah this is a nice shot. That's a great shot with, with the with on the, the bus going by. Yeah. yeah, and that's yeah, and actually on these B rolls, if I remember correctly, each one of them as we as we roll them out ends with a boat shot. Uh, of the particular country, and this time with a red bus omnibus passing by. When the when the uh, the segment opened, it was a uh, one of the tan buses. Right, right. And that, would, so, that wraps it up. Really cool stuff. Yeah, and isn't the layout of the Canada Pavilion kind of weird? Because if you start off on the left side, it's supposed to be the northwest, right? And then you you kind of like move over to uh, to Ottawa mm-hmm. with the with the hotel. Right, and and then you end up back over in BC, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> with the Victoria Gardens, and then when you go back into the mine, I th- you're back in the West again. Right, so it's kind of all mishmashed and back. Yeah, yeah. And, and like no Ontario, no Manitoba, none yep. of the Maritimes are really represented. Right, no, I don't Nova, think. Yeah, yeah, Nova Scotia completely. Yeah, there's, so about. there's it's a half Canada pavilion. <laughs> Sorry, I we're guess, missing half your provinces. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> but. Uh, so next month we'll definitely take a look at um, possibly another one of these. Uh, if we've um, we have many to release, we've released the general, the Canadian, and as well as the United Kingdom Pavilion film. So we're gonna uh, re- you know release some more over the next month or so. Um, if any of you have any films or videos um, that we haven't discussed, or or you got anything sitting in the attic you want to get restored, please send us an e- email. I'm more than happy to take a look at it and see if it's something we want to restore and uh, and 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 uh, view and get on the show as well. Um, also, too, we have a very special project going on. Um, we are in the process of restoring um, the magic of Walt Disney World from 1973, as well as a very special film from 1980, 81. It was a Magic Kingdom Club. Uh, these are very very rare copies of 16 millimeter prints, and um, I'm very very happy to announce that. Um, not only did we meet the goal of our special project that we put up, but we exceeded the monetary goal to do this. So everybody um, who participated in, in supporting us and pledging money for us to be able to bring these films to you and restore them, um, thank you very much. And I'm going to go through uh, the name shortly as, you know, that's one of the things we said we would do is get your name on the air. Um, but just to give everybody an update, the films were actually completely um, digitally restored. I'm sorry, digitally transferred uh, as of a few days ago. And uh, we hope to have them in route to us uh, later this week. And um, we'll get some screenshots up as soon as possible. So real quick here, let me just run through the names of those uh, that, that pledged and are part of this project. Uh, Matthew Bells, Len Yucalo, Matt Chakote, Glenn Welch, Justin Ponzi, Jose Arturo, Matthew Onsher, Kyle Barger, Stephen Waltersoff, Thomas Storer, Todd West, Brett Pritchett, Greg Malatek, EJ Farr, um, Brian, I'm sorry, I don't have a, a last name for you, um, Matt Fuss and Matt Fussfeld. So thank you very much for all of your pledges. Um, we even received two, two people pledged over um, $250 to help us get this done. So That's um, nuts. Wow. Yeah, we, we, we received all the funding plus plus a little extra bonus there. So um yeah, I can't wait to see these when they when they come back. So again, thank you to everybody for help helping out. I also want to give a big shout out to to Foxy. Um, she helped uh, let everybody know about this project and really helped uh, get the ball rolling on um, on the pledges. So a big thank you to her for her assistance in in making this possible. And you can check out her website at Passport to Dreams. Yeah, she's got a fantastic blog and really goes into depth. Uh, even more detail than we talk about. <laughs> so, excruciating, like minute detail, but it's fascinating. Yeah, it's amazing the stuff that she's uncovered. So, if you like what we've got here, you're gonna love what she's uh, what she's put together. So, 
So once again, thanks to Foxy for her help. All right. So the last segment of the show is listener memories. Um, for those of you who don't know, we've set up a phone number where um, you as the listener can leave us a short uh, three-minute or so message with your memory from past Disney World visits or whatever you'd like to say. Yeah, or if you just want to call and insult us. Or, yeah, yeah, tell us yeah. off. You know, leave, Talk leave. about issues of the day. <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's true. Yeah. We love to hear your political commentary. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. We'll put you on the air with that. Yeah. Trump! Trump! <laughs> hey, kid, get out of my yard. Yeah. So if, you, if you'd like to leave us a message, you can call 978 71 retro that's 978 71 retro now over the past month we did a little contest just to kind of get things rolling on it and um what we asked is we said all right to enter the contest we would have our listeners call in and sing great big beautiful tomorrow well we received more of those than i ever thought and some of you did a absolute fantastic job so what we decided to do was uh, put together a song. This is the, this is the world premiere right now of the retro <laughs> Disney World podcast singers in their world debut of Great Big Beautiful Tomorrow. Shining at the end of every day. There's a great big beautiful tomorrow. And tomorrow's just a dream away. Man has a dream and that's the star. He follows the dream with mind and heart. And when it becomes a reality, it's a dream come true. For you and me, so there's a great big beautiful tomorrow. Shining at the end of every day. There's a great big beautiful tomorrow. All right. Great job to everybody. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. Um, Very impressive. Yeah, we we had a great time putting it together. So um, thanks again. And again, if you want to leave us any message, um, by all means, give us a call at 978-71-RETRO. With that, guys, anything else for this month before we close it out? Well, I guess we should thank everybody for for listening to us. This is our our twelfth episode, right? So right. you guys yeah. hung up hung with us for a year. So thanks for that. Yep, and we hope to bring a whole nother year. And we got a lot of different ideas and surprises in store. So yeah, thanks for listening. As as always, uh, it's, it's been great bringing the show to you we've guys. Been dreaming about doing a Golden Girl style flashback episode. Now that yeah. would be a monthly episode. Show. That would just be us sitting at the table talking about. Uh, Christmases of, of the past and Mother's Days of the past and back in St. Olaf and so <laughs> remember uh, back in November we, yes. we may have to go through a year's worth of podcasts and, and pull out our greatest hits and, right. and pull out a special episode for there's that. a couple un, unheard bits that we, we have yeah. that is true too the outtakes. a couple outtakes and all sorts of good things so alright with that said let's go through our sponsors and, and, and wrap it up so um our sponsors uh, for this show, as always, are Ticket Mama. For all your Orlando area ticket needs, visit TicketMama.com for less than gate prices. And also Rental Car Mama. When renting in Orlando, visit RentalCarMama.com for discounts at Advantage Rental Car and other firms. And also buy OrlandoVacation.com, vacation homes and discount hotels for the savvy Florida traveler. And also buy WDWMap.com, get a copy of the rep- reproduction Paul Hartley map. If you're interested in sponsoring the Retro Disney World po- podcast, please email info at RetroDisneyWorld.com. And once again, thank you to all of our listeners. Keep the emails and phone calls coming. We love hearing from you. And uh, if you can, give us a a review on iTunes if possible. Let your family, friends, and know about us. And uh, again, thanks for for all your support and listening. And uh, we'll talk to you next month. So with that, Brian, take us out. Follow Todd McCartney and Retro Disney World on Twitter and Instagram at RetroWDW. On Facebook at Retro Disney World. And for all things Retro Disney World, including exclusive merchandise, visit us on the web at RetroDisneyWorld.com. On Twitter, follow our hosts, Hal Bowers, at GoAwayGreen. 
for JT Couser at Hoagie's Garage. And you can find me on Twitter and Facebook at Brian P. Miles.